you're a scientist. You discover that, that the Earth is actually round and uh, everybody else thinks it's flat. It looks something like this. You, you'd think that your, your stunning, uh, your piece of evidence and stunning revelation will make a huge impact uh, on everybody. But as you know, there, there is reason to be less than optimistic. If you look at what's happened to science over the years, you find that there's been a lot of progress, but actually the number of revolutions that have taken place is actually pretty scarce. If you think about it, think about the number of revolutions that we've seen since, uh, let's say, 1970. And I'm talking about conceptual revolutions, not technological revolutions like cell phone or the internet or something like that. And I'm talking about realized revolutions, not promised revolutions like new drug promises uh, important therapeutic progress in cancer. I'm talking about discoveries like, for example, the demonstration of the splitting of the atom which took place about 70 years ago, and I'm talking about something like the discovery of DNA, which gave us a fundamental insight into how genetics work. That was, that's about 60 years ago. So the question is, how many conceptual revolutions like that during, since 1970 can you name? Well, Science Magazine tried to, uh, to, to list them in their 125th anniversary uh, edition. And uh, they took science from the time of the Greeks until 2005, and they listed all of the most important scientific revolutions. And I took those revolutions and I made two lists. Uh, the first list on the right is all the revolutions that took place from 1965 to 2005. And another list back 100 years ago from 1905 back to 1865. And I asked a lot of people, how many of those names do you recognize? So if you look at the list, uh, this is from Science Magazine, from 1905 back, I'm sure many of you will recognize uh, almost everyone on the list. Lay people had no problem identifying most of them, and most scientists could identify everyone or almost everyone. Now I did the same thing with the, um, the current list, and I asked the same question, and people outside of science mostly knew zero, occasionally they knew one, and people inside of science knew a maximum of two out of that list. You might say, well, you know, of course it takes time for scientific revolutions to really show, but uh, one wonders, um, this list is actually, the, some of these names have been around for, since 1965, that actually is pretty much a half century. Does it really take a half century for these revolutions to, to come about? In these days of, of instant revolution on the internet, uh, overnight practically, one really wonders. And I don't want to minimize the, the, uh, the impact of what these people have found but on the right side. But some of them are incremental and a lot of them are actually technological. Uh, if you think, for example, Carey Mullis, uh, he invented the, uh, or devised the PCR technique which was really, in, in a way, ma made possible so, so many observations on, uh, using the amplification method of DNA uh, gave rise to a lot of advances. And John Gearhart figured out how to culture stem cells. And that, too, is really important in, in, in stem cell technology and, and science. But, you know, if you compare them to the kinds of revolutions that you see on the left side, J.J. Thompson, uh, the, the electron and Max Planck and quantum mechanics and such, they, they're really not, or many of them are not of the same magnitude. magnitude. So modern science has made um, a lot of advances. You can just read the newspaper and magazines all the time, but not so many revolutions of, of, of late. So the paradox is that huge amounts of money have been spent, probably in this time period, a trillion dollars, with very few revolutions. And the paradox is that 100 years ago, it wasn't zero, but almost zero institutional money and numerous revolutions. So uh, the question is why? Um, now, there are a few hypotheses you can put forth. Uh, maybe, maybe the scientists are stupider. Well, I, I hope not. Uh, maybe the problems are harder. Well, it's, an, it's a nice expedient to invoke, but I don't know of any evidence that the problems are harder now than they were then. And another possibility is, well, everything's already known. And if that's true, then 
then how, how come we haven't been able to solve all of the Earth's numerous problems? I think the problem lies in the culture of science today and the dominance of, of expert uh, opinion. We place a lot of stock in opinion of the, of the experts and it's kind of like, uh, well, you know, don't, don't disturb us, or don't disturb our important progress with your crazy ideas. Uh, so, I mean, we, we tend to treat challengers with scorn and with disdain, and something like this, you know, <laughs> no way. <laughs> um, you're, you're proposing what? <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> uh, now, for most of us, it, it's hard to entertain the possibility of, a, of a, a new kind of reality, but of course that's how science works, you know. So when Einstein, for example, proposed uh, relativity, he got hammered uh, for quite a few years, and uh, the same with Galileo uh, when, when he proposed the, solar, the helocentric uh, uh, solar system, he got serious shit. And, you know, those are, uh, for most people anyway, uh, crazy ideas turned received wisdom. But um, almost always the, the, these fresh radical ideas are, are, are welcome the way you see on the slide uh, right here. Now, there's no shortage of round earth ideas out there. I know many of them uh, from, from, from many fields, uh, from the origin of life to the origin of death, from the depths of the sea to the far reaches of, of the cosmos. Uh, dozens of them I, I'm aware of, and I'm sure are many more in fields that I'm not aware of. And the usual response uh, goes something like this, well, you know, um, if the idea is really any good, it would have been uh, discovered uh, earlier, and by now everybody would surely know about it. So your idea must be worthless junk, case closed. Uh, don't bother me with your nonsense. So we've, we've seen that sort of thing. Now, I want to give you um, uh, just a couple of uh, ideas or a couple of examples of some, you might say, uh, unconventional ideas. Tesla, for example, uh, showed that you could tap atmospheric electricity and maybe get energy out of that. And one incarnation of this, this is uh, from 1925, and it's a way of getting that energy, and it's, uh, it's cool. It's, uh, it's some balloons that are suspended high up with a conducting ring suspended beneath, and one electrode is attached to that conducting ring and another electrode to ground. And the potential difference between these two, which is very substantial, is enough to run a motor. And modern incarnations of this have, uh, have been able to produce quite a lot of, of, of energy. And this is basically free energy. So this is harvestable energy, but we really don't understand how, what's going on to, to create it exactly. It's a scientific question whose answer could possibly reveal a lot of really good stuff. The second critical issue is health. Uh, so, for example, consider cancer, and uh, this is a book that you probably don't, don't know about. This, this is uh, Emmanuel Ravici, uh, about his life and how he, was, he discovered and developed a system. The, the idea is that during cancer, uh, the pH of body fluids changes, and with these changes, the attempt was made to, re to return these pH values back to their normal values, and this was extremely successful. In fact, um, um, one of the quotes that uh, on the back of the book, I don't know how he does it, but people walk in dead and walk out alive. And this is not by an insignificant person. It was the fellow who just retired as the director of the Sloan Kettering Cancer Research Institute. So you'd think that something like this would uh, attract attention and maybe get some clinical trials going, but n nothing. And in fact, people touting alternative method are typically treated with scorn and with disdain. And disdain. In fact, they're prosecuted, uh, some feel, to the fullest extent of the law because they must be charlatans because everybody knows that if this is any good, it would have been in all the clinics around the world. Therefore, it's worthless. So the problems remain unsolved and the problems of getting energy, problems of curing cancer, uh, so many different areas that remain um, unsolved and basically we routinely reject the out-of-the-box ideas that might lead to solutions. So now why does the scientific enterprise discourage these radical ideas? And I think it's because there are three reasons that I propose. There are more. One is the institutional bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy 
is kind of ironic, but uh, the bureaucracy that is supposed to, to foster innovation actually does exactly the reverse. And why does it do the reverse? Because if someone comes in with a, a round earth idea, it'll be the flat earth people, who, the experts, who get to review it. And we all understand what will happen, some fate similar to this. <laughs> you know, and the poor fellow is about to lose his head. So scientists understand that, that you know, if you don't want to lose your head, <laughs> You better keep it safe. Don't challenge the orthodoxy. That, that's the, the general rule. Just keep it safe. And so that's one problem. The second problem is the emphasis on minutia. Um, and uh, so the modern science dwelling place is, is at the periphery of the, of the tree of knowledge. So people will stake out a particular area and become the world's expert on that one narrow area. Why do they do that? Well, it's convenient if you become the world's expert on some narrow area, it's easier to get funded because when the funds are only enough to cover 10% of all the applications, you're in a good position if you're the world's expert on something. And so people are, it's like a rat race, everybody is trying to become the world's expert in some narrow area to make sure that they get funded. Um, and, and this is a problem because it doesn't leave, leave the, the space and the sense of looking of thinking and reflecting and, and asking the question, well, you know, is it possible that one of the foundational limbs in this tree, particularly the limb that supports your area, is really sound or not? And the, re the, the revolution comes when someone realizes that a limb is rotten, the very limb that's supporting the particular branchlet on which you're working. It makes it irrelevant for you to do, to become the expert on that particular branch if the limb is rotten. And we get advances from some new growth that may produce something fruitful and enduring. So the em emphasis on becoming an expert in something very narrow doesn't allow us, doesn't give us the luxury of looking back and, and looking for, for soundness and perhaps making an important contribution. And the other is vested interests. Well, you know, if you're vested in the status quo, you might act to preserve the status quo because it is in your best interest. Now, I, I um, and usually some of the people or corporations have the wherewithal to be effective in, in, in this. I don't like to think that vested interests are in any way impacting the search for truth, but my colleagues and students and such keep telling me that this is a real issue and a very important issue. So these are the kinds of things that discourage the radical approaches. And so your round earth proposal that is, is coming in is not likely to succeed because, because the scientific culture is very conservative and, and constraining. And, uh, and, and that's the reason why we've had few revolutions for decades. It's safe science that's produced this. So what's the solution? Um, well, um, I would like to propose a solution and it's called, it's a foundation called the Institute for Venture Science or IVS. It's not here yet, but hopefully it will be coming soon. Now this institute, is a, it's a foundation. It's a foundation that uh, funds innovative kinds of uh, proposals, the most promising ideas that can turn previous understanding upside down. And it provides the wherewithal to support this, this kind of thing. Now what makes this uniquely different is this. It doesn't fund one grant, on a particular idea, it funds a dozen on the same ideas. And the idea then is that you get a critical mass of effort going into this one, shall we say, round earth idea. So, so it's, not, it's not one person uh, pursuing it, one person, it's easy to dismiss one person as a crackpot or a nutcake or something like that. When you have a dozen uh, groups coming to, for example, the annual meeting of the Shape of the Earth Society, reporting, hey, you know, 12 different methods showing that, you know, you guys think the earth is flat, but it looks like it's round. That can quickly lead to a revolution. The two are competing, the round earth and flat earth are competing on the same podium. And soon it becomes obvious which one is correct. If it's the round earth idea, then quickly there'll be a revolution. On the other hand, it may be that the flat earth is really better, the evidence is there, and that's also okay because the evidence has strengthened the flat earth point of view. So the money that's invested is invested very well no matter who comes out the winner. Uh, okay, so how, do you, how does this work? Well, 
A proposal is submitted and uh, the submission process is different from usual uh, grants. So the question is what's wrong with the prevailing paradigm and how does the proposed paradigm, how is it superior? And that goes to some gatekeeping office, shall we say, uh, people who are reviewing this who have a lot of experience and an open mind but a critical mind throwing out the flaky proposals, the obviously flaky ones. And the ones that get past this, next step is that you ask the orthodoxy or the establishment to respond. Now obviously, they're not going to like it. However, the proposer gets a chance to respond. And all of this is done in the open. It's transparent. Uh, and, and it's on the web. And so people can pay attention to it. It's a kind of debate, you might say. And the reviewers who are looking at the proposal and the debate are from outside the field. They have no stake in, in the outcome. And so they assign a priority score which is based on uh, two criteria. Is it likely to succeed? And how would it shake the earth if it does succeed? Now if it scores high enough on those criteria, it's selected. And then an administrator with some advice from, from the person who selected invites additional labs following the same paradigm and the funding goes to the top, say, 10 to 12 labs, and that establishes a critical mass, which is what is needed. So what you get from this is that you get revolutions in multiple fields occurring. And the revolutions, these are beyond Nobel Prizes. These are revolutions that can actually really change the world. They lead to new technologies inevitably because new scientific findings lead to that. And they also lead to economic revitalization. And the economic revitalization gives us a sense of future. The sense of future seems to be absent. The world is filled with problems. And this is a route that can, I think, address those problems, starting with creating these revolutions in many fields. So how do we go about doing this? Well, at first, we sent a letter to President Obama. It was just when he was elected, and we expected wonders. We got back a thank you very much letter, but it did have the White House, Pennsylvania Avenue on the upper left-hand corner, and uh, a lot of people were impressed by that. Well, we gave it some thought. This, this letter, by the way, was endorsed by 75 prominent people from around the country, including some very heavyweights. And we also put together a 21-page document detailing exactly how that would work. And you can, if you like, see details from our uh, home page. And we assembled the beginnings of a board of directors, which consists of a former dean of a university, um, a former vice president of a large technological corporation, and a former president of a famous university. Now, in terms of funding, we're looking for a $10 billion endowment. And out of that, a half a billion dollar per year interest we expect, and that would fund about 50 ideas times 10 labs uh, simultaneously. Now, it seems like a lot of money, but the per year, five, half a billion dollars interest is actually less than 1% of the U.S. annual budget. And out of that, we expect revolutions. How many? Well, you know, out of 50, perhaps five, perhaps more, it's not clear. These are revolutions that could change the world. Now, where do you get the money? Well, governments are possible, but usually strings are attached, and they move slowly. And private sources are another possibility. You know, there are many very wealthy people out there who are looking from some, for some meaningful legacy to leave behind them. And helping, uh, either creating or helping to create this institute is a good way to realize this objective. It's kind of like the Gates Foundation. I think Bill Gates will be remembered less for his Microsoft fortune than for cre creating something like the Gates Foundation. We need a billion dollars or so to start with to get going, to get a facility and a staff and to start funding a few grants and the rest within three years. We have excellent leadership, a detailed operative plan, and I think a gangbusters idea to succeed to impact the world. I mean, we just need the startup funds to, to, start to get to the first step of creating this institute for venture science for the future of humanity. Thank you. Thank you.